Today is the 29th of March, 2012. We are in uh, Schenectady, New York at the Kingsway Apartment Complex. My name is Wayne Clark. I'm from the New York State Military Museum. Sir, for the record, would you please state your full name and your date and place of birth, please? Yes, my name is Kenneth Hagedorn. I was born and grew up in Cohoes. I was born in April 1920. Graduated from Cohoes High School in 1937. Did you go on to college at that point or go to work? No, I went from there directly to the General Electric Company in Schenectady where I became a machinist apprentice, which is a four-year training program. Mm -hmm. And what did you do at GE? Uh, what, did, what did you make as an apprentice? Or you just learned to operate? Well, uh, the apprentice training program was uh, uh, we learned to operate uh, various machine tools. Mm -hmm. uh, for the first year or so, I was in a trading room, but after that, uh, we actually worked in the factory you know, under the direction of, of journeymen. And it was a four-year program, uh, mm -hmm. and I finished that program in 1940. Do you remember where you were and what you were doing when you heard about the attack on mm -hmm. Pearl Harbor? Yes, on Sunday, December 7th, uh, I and my girlfriend had just come from church to her house. We were going to have uh, Sunday dinner there. And while we were waiting for dinner to be prepared, her father, who was in another room listening to the radio, shouted very excitedly, We're fighting a war! And uh, from, from then on, we were talking most about the war and listening to the radio. Mm -hmm. It happened that uh, we had ideas that particular day about talking about uh, setting a wedding date. Oh. Uh, but uh, that was kind of pushed into the background and for the next week we wondered, well, there's a war going on, what are we going to do about it? Uh, but the following Sunday, we decided that war or no war, we had to keep on living, so we set a wedding date of April of 1942. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, when did you go into the service? I went into the service in 1944 because I had a draft exemption because I was a skilled uh, I see. tradesman at uh, GE. By that time you were a... Uh what yes, they would I, call a journeyman uh, machinist? Yes, well, or? On, when I graduated uh, in 1940, I became a toolmaker and worked uh, for a while as a toolmaker, and then later became a foreman. Mm -hmm. but during the time that I worked as a toolmaker, uh, because the war was going on and, and uh, it was, uh, I worked in the GE uh, Aviation and Ordnance Division. And uh, the product of that particular department was uh, uh, gun control uh, instrumentation for airplanes. And of course, because that was essential uh, uh, defense work, mm -hmm. I got a draft deferment. Uh, the classification was 1A. Mm -hmm. And uh, I continued with that 1A classification as a toolmaker and later as a foreman. <clears throat> And uh, periodically, uh, we got a 1A classification. We, we took it to uh, our management, and they arranged for deferments when we were reclassified to 2B, which meant essential uh, uh, defense worker. Mm -hmm. And uh, that 1A popped up periodically, and we were supposed to take them to the boss. Well, after a time, uh, I felt uncomfortable uh, not being in the service. Uh, the, uh, one of the things was that there was a classification 4F, and the uh, 4F class classification was, quote, physically, mentally, or morally unfit for, for service. And uh, uh, so I began to think as, uh, of what the street people were looking at me and saying, that guy must be a 4 -er. uh -huh. Uh, because I didn't live in Schenectady, I, I lived in Waterford, which was a community mm -hmm. about 15 or 20 miles away. And so when I got a 1A uh, classification, instead of taking it to management to get a continued deferment, 
I just pretended it never got there until it was too late to process the deferment. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up in the Navy in April 1944. Now, you were drafted and, or did you end well, up yes, enlisting? Yes, I, I, I was drafted. Uh, I guess you might say I was voluntarily drafted because I didn't know mm -hmm. anything about the 1A card. Okay. So, now you weren't drafted into the Navy, right? You had to enlist in the Navy? or uh, No, I was drafted. Oh, okay. I, yeah, I didn't I, realize they... they... No, I, when I got the 1A classification, mm -hmm. I just didn't do anything. And I, right. I, I, I let the, the process take its course and okay. I eventually was called in. So they put you in the Navy? Yes. Okay. Now, let me just go back a little bit. What was GE like uh, during the war? Was Obviously, they were going full tilt, uh, very busy. That was very interesting. Now, uh, as an example of busy, as a toolmaker, <clears throat> I worked uh, uh, 13 days in a row. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there was a law that said uh, that we couldn't work more than 13 days in a row, so we had every Sunday off. Uh, and in addition to that, for three nights a week, uh, we worked three extra hours each, which added up to quite a lot of working hours. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> and uh, that went on uh, as long as I was a toolmaker. And when I became a foreman, I worked on the uh, graveyard shift, uh, 11 at night to 7 in the morning. And uh, I supervised quite a number of, uh, of uh, machine operators of various kinds. And uh, I commuted from Waterford in a carpool. And carpooling was a big thing then during the war uh, because of uh, gasoline. Gasoline was rationed. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there were quite a few men who worked at GE who were able to own and operate cars because they got uh, special uh, uh, ration cards, special ration cards for gasoline. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would take each, usually take four passengers and were paid two dollars a week. And uh, with, with a special ration card and the, and the two dollars a week from each of the four passengers that are pretty happy to have them on their cars. And I suspect many of them couldn't have had cars during that time if it wasn't for those arrangements. Oh. Now, was there a military presence at GE? Uh, there was, but uh, not that I was aware of. GE was a big plant, mm -hmm. and uh, there were uh, representatives of the military there, but uh, they were off in some other buildings, so I wasn't exposed to them. Okay. So, when exactly did you go into the Navy? Uh, in. April of 1944, and, okay. I, and uh, I, I was at the boot camp at Sampson, New York for 11 weeks where I went from 202 pounds to 170 pounds uh, without, without dieting. <laughs> now you were married? Uh, uh, yes, I was married okay. at the time. Uh, and, uh, now how did your wife feel about you being drafted? Uh, well, uh, she, I don't recall that she was particularly agitated about it. Uh, it was mm -hmm. just one of those things that happened to everybody. Sure. Uh, in fact, I don't believe I ever told anybody about my trickery with a draft card until maybe a month or two ago from now. Oh. <laughs> so she never knew about it. Okay. So, so you went to Samson for 11 weeks. Went to Samson for 11 weeks. And then I, uh, as usual, I took some... I guess they would call them aptitude tests. Mm -hmm. And as a result of those tests, I was sent to the Fire Control Operation and Maintenance School at Treasure Island in San Francisco Bay. And that was a, a, about a four-month uh, training program where we learned the technology of, uh, of fire control uh, operation and maintenance. Now, when I say fire control, the first thing people think of is squirting uh, hoses on, on fire. That, that's not what it was. Mm -hmm. It was uh, fire control had to do with the instrumentation that direct and pointed the guns at the targets. Uh, it, uh, they, they read the range and the distance and the travel and the relative uh, 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 
speed and motion of the ship and the target. Mm -hmm. It was a very complicated uh, mechanism. They were really computers, but not computers as we think of them now, uh, because computers now are uh, entirely electronic, whereas uh, the, the computers that were used in the Navy during World War II for, for gunfire control were mostly or I would say 95% mechanical, using gears and, and uh, uh, gyroscopes mm -hmm. and various other uh, uh, me mechanical uh, components to do much of the work. It was calculation and, and uh, information mm -hmm. processing, like computers now, but very, very prim primitive compared to what's going on now. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and then uh, after fire control school, I was assigned to uh, an attack transport, which was APA-128, which was a USS Aranac. I have a picture of it here. Okay. Uh, okay, got it. These ships were made in large quantities. They were called victory okay. ships. You put it down. There were also liberty ships, uh, which were somewhat different. But the victory ship referred to the type of hull. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were both personnel carriers, which I served on, and cargo ships with the same kind of hull. And uh, the, the uh, attack transports, the APAs, which stood for Auxiliary Personnel Attack, uh, uh, the ships had a crew of about 500 and a capacity of troop carrying of approaching 5,000. Now, I don't believe we ever had 5,000 uh, troops aboard the ship, but it could mm -hmm. have held them. But we've had many times, many trips, more than 3,000, and that was very crowded. And among other things I can tell you is it was quite an experience to be aboard a ship with two or three thousand seasick marines. Oh. <laughs> uh, and uh, in, in the course of that service, we traveled mostly from the equator to Hawaii, back and forth, from one island to another, uh, carrying troops in one instance into battle at Okinawa, and in other instances it wasn't battle, it was to secured uh, islands are uh, taking wounded home mm -hmm. and uh, things of that sort. <clears throat> we uh, uh, our, the, the battle that I experienced, the only one, was Okinawa. And uh, that, that was uh, quite an operation. Uh, we, we put uh, multiple thousands of troops over the side uh, in, into the small boats and uh, put them ashore while uh, our, our ship would often leave out at a safe distance while that was going on. And I recall <coughs> that there was a, either a cruiser or a battleship which was farther out from us. So we were between the ship and the shore. And day and night for two or three days and nights, they were constantly firing their big guns on the shore. and it, sounded like the missiles were going directly over us mm -hmm. and they made loud whistling noises. Well, after the second night we were able to sleep and ignore it. Uh, <clears throat> and also, uh, there was a, a hospital ship which was uh, anchored there while the battle was going on. And uh, from a distance we could see the boats coming and going, taking the wounded aboard the the hospital ship, and later on, I guess the hospital ship uh, probably got filled up because we started taking what I call walking wounded mm -hmm. uh, aboard our ship, and we we had uh, oh 40 or 50 of those guys, and after a while, uh, while the battle was sort of winding down but still going on, we took off and took those wounded to. Uh, Hawaii mm -hmm. to Pearl Harbor and left them there and took another load of uh, troops and we took them to Guam and uh, Guam was already secured at that time and uh, 
an interesting thing I noted there was that I had to go ashore to do some maintenance work at a shop on some fire control equipment. And I had time to sort of hang around while the work was being done. And I noticed a, a bunch of Japanese prisoners uh, doing some kind of road construction work. And I looked around for somebody guarding them. And all I could see uh, was a, a private first class sitting on the ground with his back against a tree with his rifle leaning against another tree about 10 feet away. And he was supposed to be guarding those people. So mm -hmm. I asked him, how come? I said, aren't, aren't you concerned about those guys? <laughs> and he said, look at them. They're fat and happy. They don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you were on Okinawa, well, out in the, out in the ocean, yeah. were you attacked at all by kamikazes? Uh, no, uh, that was something I often wondered about. Maybe that was their tactics. Uh, that uh, uh, convoy mm -hmm. uh, that did the attack consisted of uh, 13 cargo ships, which carried the tanks and equipment and guns and stuff like that, and 12 uh, personnel carriers, uh, like my ship. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, of course there were destroyer escorts and other ships like that uh, along with us. And uh, they, the, the convoy split at the south end of Okinawa. That Okinawa is sort of a peninsula, I guess. Uh, and uh, the cargo ships went around one side, and the personnel ships went up the other side to hit the beach on that side. And for some reason, the Japanese planes concentrated on the cargo ships. And uh, they were, there was quite a lot of bombing, and some of them were sunk. But uh, only two or three just made one or two passes over our side and, mm -hmm. and fired their 50 caliber guns at us. And, and I can remember one guy managed to go pop, pop, pop along our deck and make a few dents, but that's, that's the extent of mm -hmm. <laughs> the shooting that we experienced. Anyone injured aboard ship? No, uh, not aboard my ship. No. No. So that was kind of uneventful. I did. The ship did go back to Okinawa again another time to take replacement troops after it was secured. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a, a, a duty that made it necessary for me to go ashore. And what I remember is mud, like, like no mud I ever experienced anywhere. Mm -hmm. And there were jeeps and other vehicles barked down in the mud and so on, and I had to I didn't walk through the mud. I found ways to, away from the road to get through it. Mm -hmm. Another time, <clears throat> uh, we went to Saipan, uh, which is near Guam, and, and that, that was secured at that time. And what I recall about that is uh, B-25s uh, taking off and landing day and night so close together that I, I thought they, were, they weren't flying safely. They, they just one plane after another, uh, not more than a few hundred feet apart as they were constantly landing and taking off. Uh, and I was pretty sure they were going off to bomb Japan or some islands, but mm -hmm. I was never certain about that. Okay. <clears throat> do, you, um, do, do you recall where you were when you heard about the uh, death of President Roosevelt? Uh, yes, uh, uh, we were out in the middle of the Pacific somewhere, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the officers came by, and I was doing something or other uh, aboard the ship, and he said, did you hear the news? I said, no, what news? He said, uh, you just lost your president, and uh, that's, that's what I heard. And uh, I think... The other very interesting part of uh, my experience was that uh, uh, in, nine, I believe it was early 1945, the timing was coincident with the dropping of the atomic bomb, whatever that was. Uh, <coughs> our ship w went back to the Oakland Navy Yard mm -hmm. for some fixing up and not, not war damage, but just wear and tear, mm -hmm. for fixing up and repainting and so on, and, and uh, some modernization of, of some of the equipment. And we 
joined a convoy of quite a large number of personnel carriers, cargo ships, uh, uh, destroyer escorts, and uh, one cruiser. And uh, we were told that uh, we were going off for a big deal, but we weren't to told what the big deal was. Mm -hmm. But it turned out that it was to be a full-scale assault on the southern part of Japan uh, to a, a place called Wakayama. And uh, we were out in the middle of the Pacific somewhere, and I got up one morning and I noticed that all of the ships, the, the uh, personnel carriers and the cargo ships, were just going around in a great big circle uh, with the escorts uh, going around in a circle outside and in another direction. And that continued for uh, a couple of days. And then finally the, the circle broke off and we went on to Wakayama. But by that time we found out that the reason for that was that the first atomic bomb had dropped and uh, the, uh, the orders that came to, to our, our convoy was, well, just hang out someplace and wait and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And when the second bomb was dropped and the surrender came, then the orders were to just go ahead to Wakayama anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> uh, we, we went. Of course, by that time, the war was over. And uh, uh, we want to show we actually went on liberty mm -hmm. in uh, uh, the, the village of Wakayama. Wakayama was a fishing village. And uh, there was, that was kind of interesting. And, and the ship was divided into two watches, the port and starboard watch. Uh, and I was in a starboard watch, and the port watch got the first uh, li liberty. And they went ashore, and the guys come back, and they told uh, wonderful stories about what you could do for cigarettes. Uh, money was no good. You could do anything for cigarettes. But that, that didn't last long, because uh, somebody somewhere decided that we're making a mess of the economy of Japan by substituting cigarettes for money. So uh, we were told that there was a rule that we could take no more than 19 cigarettes uh, ashore, which obviously meant an open pack. Yeah. And well, when I heard about all the goodies that, that the other guys had, I decided I would, that they, they weren't going to deprive me of that. So I got a lot of cigarettes, which incidentally, board ship cost 50 cents for a carton. <laughs> and uh, I, I put uh, a pack in each armpit and a couple around my waistband and uh, one in each sock. And uh, got a little shock when we went ashore and uh, there was a, a, an armed uh, naval officer and uh, six Marines. Uh, and they were searching everybody as we got off the, the Liberty boats. And I was walking down among them with my hands up like this. And uh, I got all through the line thinking I had made it. And I turned like this. And the Marine had his arm on my elbow. His arm went down like that. He felt the cigarette in my arm, the cigarette package in my armpit. And uh, that officer pounced on me, took my Liberty card. And uh, the result was that I was restricted to the ship uh, for until we again reached the United States port. Oh boy. And, uh, but uh, I went, and that was months. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but uh, uh, actually, the gunnery officer took pity on me and he, he gave me some uh, shore duty uh, while, while we were in port. Like, for example, once I was a, what they call a guard mail petty officer when uh, uh, I took mail from the ship to, uh, a station to shore and brought it back, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they gave me a big 45, and I didn't learn how to shoot a 45 or cock it until many years later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, to go going back to the uh, trip to Wakayama when we were interrupted by the the dropping of the atomic bomb, I often think that. Perhaps I owe my life to Harry Truman for, for dropping the bomb while we were on our way over to mm -hmm. do some real shooting. Okay. Now, you have uh, some photographs of that, of that town? Uh, of 
about, oh yes, what, what, yes, I, I have some. They're not very good photographs. These photographs that I have here, incidentally, in this album, mm -hmm. they, are, they are bootleg photographs which were taken by another sailor because uh, uh, there, there was a rule, uh, there was a violation of the security rules for any of us to have cameras. Okay. Uh, but he had a secret camera and he took them. And uh, I have pictures of Wakayama. Uh, now here are some pictures of uh, these. These top three pictures. Actually, if you, you hold hold it back a little farther, and it's easier for me to zoom in. Okay. Those top three pictures are, are Japanese fishermen who came up alongside, and, and they were actually begging for food. Oh. Okay. I don't think they got much. Okay. <clears throat> Now, um, how long were you in Japan, or, or off the coast of Japan? Well, uh, after we were in Wakayama for a while, uh, for reasons that uh, I never learned, we went uh, to several Japanese ports. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to uh, Sasebo, and Sasebo is where there was a, uh, a Japanese naval base. And uh, we weren't carrying people, we were just there and uh, mm -hmm. something was going on, but I never knew what. Did you get to go ashore there? No. Uh, all I have, I have a picture here of a, a Japanese destroyer, which was at anchor there. If I can find it. Now, you were discharged in 1946. Yes, February 1946. So, from the time you, you left Japan till the time you were discharged, where, whereabouts were you? Uh, from the time, well, as I said, I'm sorry, I, I can't find that. Thing. That's all right. It's, it's only a picture of a, dis, of a Japanese destroyer, anyway. Uh, uh, we visited several ports in Japan, mm -hmm. as I said, for reasons that I don't know about. Uh, there were uh, Nagoya, which was almost totally destroyed, by the way, not by atomic bomb, but by conventional bombing. Mm -hmm. So I saw that, and uh, Sasebo, and uh, one okay. or two other Japanese ports, and I don't recall what they were. So you you were discharged early on in '46, uh, February first. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you ended up going back to the states. Yeah, and we we got back to Portland, and uh, by that time uh, they had set up this the point system for discharge mm -hmm. uh, when the. They, they were credited with a certain number of points for length of service and ver various other things. And uh, when we got into Portland, uh, a lot of the crew members uh, were dashing around and getting packed up, uh, happily getting ready to go home. Uh, and it was based on, they found out about it because the names were posted up on a bulletin board in the ship. And I didn't bother to look at it because uh, I didn't have enough points. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody said to me, well, you don't look very excited. Uh, don't, don't you want to go home or worse than that effect? And I said, oh, I don't have enough points. And he said, oh, your name is on the board. So I dashed over and looked in my name to go to the, to the discharge station was on the board. So I packed up in a hurry. I left a lot behind, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and it turned out that uh, I, I and some others were close enough to having enough points uh, so that uh, they didn't want to take us off to 
some distant port somewhere in the Pacific and discharge us from there and have the complications of getting us back home. Mm -hmm. So they, they just ignored the few points that we liked and away we went. Okay. So how did you, how did you get back, back here? Uh, I was given some kind of a railroad pass mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I, I got on a train to Portland and changed at Kansas City and then changed again in Chicago and eventually got home. I think it took about six days. Mm -hmm. How long had it been since you had been home or seen your wife? Uh, well, that's actually there are two answers to the question. Mm -hmm. One was uh, I hadn't been home except for boot leave immediately after I, I got out of boot camp. Mm -hmm. But at that time, uh, during the war, uh, my wife decided that since I was in the fire control school in, in uh, San Francisco oh. uh, for three or four months, and I'd probably on a ship in the Pacific, she thought it would be a great idea if she came and lived in San Francisco. I didn't think it was a good idea, but she came anyway. <laughs> and uh, uh, it happened that I had an aunt who lived in a, an apartment house in San Francisco, and she arranged for my wife to get a, an apartment there in the apartment house where she was. Oh. So, uh, in a sense, during that uh, three or four months that I, I was a, at the fire control school, I was a schoolboy who went to school during the day, five days a week, and then came home to our apartment in San Francisco uh, in the evening and over some of the weekends. Mm -hmm. What was life like in San Francisco then? It was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was, of course, it was just full of servicemen and there mm -hmm. were all, all kinds of things going on and uh, the restaurants were great and uh, uh, because uh, we had a lot of spare time, it, even though we had classes all day for five days a week, we still had uh, some evenings and, mm -hmm. and weekends. So we did a lot of things and we saw a lot of things. But the one thing that I remember uh, most clearly is uh, our restaurant that overlooked uh, the Seal Rocks in San Francisco Bay, which sort of became our hangout. Mm -hmm. Now, did you see any um, USO shows or any celebrities, anything uh, like that? Yes, uh, I saw a few. Uh, uh, the, what I remember was in, in some theater, Victor Mature, Chief Boson's mate, Victor Mature, uh, was giving a show. And of course, uh, to our, our knowledge, he had uh, even been to, hadn't been to sea, but uh, he was just a, a Navy entertainer, mm -hmm. and I made him a chief bosun's mate, and uh, he got a lot of uh, uh, razzing and hooting and howling from the regular sailors when <laughs> he was up on the stage, because they didn't think much of him giving a chief bosun mate rating as no. an actor. And uh, there were others, uh, there were, but uh, he's the only celebrity that I recall. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were uh, USO activities. Uh, there was a USO center there in, that, uh, uh, because I was, in a way, a married man with a home in San Francisco, I didn't bother much with the USO. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, what rank were you when you were discharged? I was a fire control in second class. Okay. And uh, it was, I, I think, unusual, even during wartime, to reach a second-class petty officer rating in less than two years, which, which I did. Uh, and there were a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is that the, the uh, fire control training school was pretty demanding. And it was somewhat unusual that most of us got uh, ratings based on our final exams Mm -hmm. of third class petty officer almost immediately. And uh, the, uh, the ship that I was on, uh, it, it had a limited amount of fire control equipment, not like a destroyer or a, or a, a cruiser. Mm -hmm. So uh, there were only four of us, who, five of us, who worked as fire control. And the, 
the senior fire controlman uh, was a chief, and uh, he was transferred quickly, very short time after the, we, I came aboard the ship. And then uh, a third class petty officer became senior petty officer, and uh, he, by reputation that I think he deserved, was something of a politician and an operator, and somehow he promoted shore duty for himself. Well, uh, I was, even though I was a third class petty officer, I was next in line of seniority among the fire controlmen, and we expected somebody would come in to be put in charge of us, but instead the uh, uh, gunnery officer called me and he said, I want you to take the second class exam. And uh, I sort of gulped and gasped, and I said, so quick, and he said, yeah, I want you to take it. So I took it, I became a second class petty officer, and then I was a senior fire controlman aboard the ship. Hmm. And, uh, which, speaking of seniority, it springs to mind, I think I was p possibly the only one, or one of the few of the active enlisted men in the United States Navy who had a private stateroom aboard the ship. Uh, and, uh, that came about because the, the ship had four what were called radar rooms, that, and they were they were on the main deck level, below the guns, which the guns were above the main deck mm -hmm. level, and uh, they were reserved for ra radar. But radar was something new then, and, and the fighting ships got the priority for the radar, so we never got it. And uh, <coughs> I was the fire control and, and the gunner's mates we're sharing a workshop where we did our repair work and things like that. And uh, uh, I decided that uh, I liked the looks of one of those rooms, so I went to the gunnery officer who, who uh, well, I'll say it was easy to, to, to fool him. Uh, and uh, I, I said, it, I didn't think it was a good idea for the fire controlmen with their uh, very delicate instruments to be working in the same workshop with, with the gunner's mates with our dirty, greasy, old, oily gun parts. And uh, I thought that we might as well use one of those radar rooms for a fire control shop. And he thought that was a good idea. So I got the ship fitters to uh, weld uh, eyes on opposite corners of that room. I slung a hammock and uh, put up a few workbenches there to make it look good and got my gear up there. And for the rest of the war, I had a private state home. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds pretty good. And how was, how was the food aboard ship? Uh, I was one of those strange people who liked all the Navy food. Uh -huh. yeah, and uh, uh, to, uh, I was, I, one of my favorite foods was SOS. Yeah. <laughs> And I think you know what that is. I do, yeah. <laughs> and I, I guess most people who, were, who watch this will know what SOS is. Well, anyone that was in the service will. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, you were discharged. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you make use of the GI Bill at all, or the, what they call the 5220 Club? I, I, I certainly did. <laughs> well, to begin with, uh, when at the time I was discharged, the General Electric plant was on strike, mm -hmm. so uh, I, I couldn't get back to work, obviously. And uh, so <clears throat> I joined the 5220 Club, which was a sort of a special unemployment insurance for returning veterans. Mm -hmm. And the, at the 5220 meant we were eligible for $20 a week for 52 weeks. And I didn't use it up for 52 weeks, but. Uh, between the $20 uh, a week that I got and uh, my wife's employment at a bank, uh, we did fine. I was mm -hmm. not in a great hurry to get back to work, although eventually I did. Mm -hmm. You went back to GE? I went back to GE. And uh, uh, actually, the, the first year after I went back, uh, I had a job which existed as a result of the war. Uh, my job with GE uh, was to see that the returning veterans got 
their jobs back. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, in most cases, somebody else had those jobs. But uh, one part of the GI Bill of Rights was this right to return to employment that I guess a lot of people don't know about. But uh, quoting from the law, uh, they, each returning veteran was entitled to a job of like seniority status and pay. Mm -hmm. And the employer was really legally required to honor that. So I was given the job of implementing that at the General Electric plant in Schenectady, which meant uh, digging into the records, uh, finding out where the man had worked before, uh, finding out what the situation was with respect to his job. In most cases, somebody else was on the job. And so the first step was to, to find a similar job that was as good as he had before mm -hmm. and that he was satisfied with. And if he refused it, then he was entitled to bump the, the person who had that job. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, it was my job to find a job for that guy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so were you pretty busy doing that? Oh, yeah. I that, that, that was quite active in that. And, of course, part of doing that job was to uh, go down into the factory to tough old general foreman and say, well, you've got to let this guy go and put this guy in his place. And some of them were kind of unhappy with it. But, mm -hmm. uh, eventually uh, we we managed to work it out in each situation. And I did that for about a year. And that part of the work was done. So then I went back uh, into the factory as a foreman. Mm -hmm. Now, did you... Uh join any veterans organizations like the VFW or the, the Legion at all? No, I didn't. Did you uh, stay in contact with anyone you were in the service with or attend any kind of re ship's reunions? No, I didn't do any of that. Uh, the, okay. uh, I guess my attitude was uh, that phase of my life is over. I'm going to <laughs> look, at, look at the future. Okay. How do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? I certainly learned a lot and uh, learned to travel, I think, uh, and uh, just, just in general broadened my outlook. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of interesting experiences. One, one that came to mind was that uh, after the I finished the fire control school training. Uh, I got a week's leave. Mm -hmm. So my wife, who was also living in San Francisco then, she and I uh, went back home to uh, Waterford for a week. And we were on a train in a car from San Francisco to Chicago on the northern route in the middle of winter. And it was one of those old railroad cars that you've probably seen only in a Western movie. Uh, it had the, the carpeting uh, upholstery on the seats. Mm -hmm. It had gas, gas lamp fixtures were still there in the car, even though it was electrified, but the fixtures were there. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody on that car uh, was a serviceman on leave, either some, many of them with their wives. And somebody found a screwdriver and took the back of his seat off, put the seat on a pile of luggage in between the two seats, and made a bed. And that screwdriver went up and down that car, nothing flat, and, uh, and, <laughs> and every seat was converted to a bed. So we, <laughs> we, we had Pullman service all the way to Chicago. <laughs> all right. Uh, any other comments or reflections? Uh, Well, one of the things I recall, which may be relevant now, is, is the rationing during the war. Oh, yes. Uh, we, of course, uh, I, I lived in Waterford until 1944, so uh, we, I, was, I was a civilian then mm -hmm. and experienced the rationing. And uh, I recall that meat, butter, sugar, and coffee, probably other things, were rationed. And uh, 
depending on the size of the family or various other things, people got monthly uh, ration stamps. And uh, the stamps would be taken to the, the grocer or whoever it was. Mm -hmm. and he'd tear off as many as uh, were required for what we wanted to buy, and that's the way it worked. Except for the meat. Now, the meat was different in that uh, we got meat tokens, which were little red circular cardboard discs about the size of a dime. Uh, they, they were the meat tokens. And uh, uh, there was a lot of, uh, I guess you call it black market work, where people were selling to each other and so on. That, that went on. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I don't recall that we ever experienced shortages. I suspect that part of the rationing was to uh, get get the populace all revved up about the war effort, mm -hmm. uh, that, because it, it, I didn't, I wasn't aware of any shortages. Okay. But we still had to use the ration cards. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for your interview. Thank you.